another year, another glamorous awards ceremony to go to. Now, I love cinema, but there's one thing that consistently disappoints me about it. It's the biggest awards ceremony of them all, the Oscars, or more precisely, their celebration of bland mediocrity over genuine innovation. Now, though, it's time to right those wrongs. But forget Hollywood, this is East Finchley, the home of my awards. And imaginatively enough, they're called the Kermodes. So sit back, relax, and enjoy my celebration of the very best that cinema has to offer. Good evening, and welcome to the sixth annual Kermode Awards, the antidote to the Oscars, which, let us never forget, are the awards which didn't give a best film statuette to Citizen Kane or Raging Bull or The Exorcist, but did give one to Titanic and Driving Miss Daisy. There'll be no such travesties of justice here where the rules are simple. A film or filmmaker can't get their hands on one of these for a category in which they've been nominated for an Academy Award. That's it. Got it? Good. Off we go. Make no mistake, this year the Oscar for Best Actor is going to go to Colin Firth for his role as a stuttering monarch in The King's Speech. I have received... ..from oh, His oh, Majesty... Oh, the... <laughs> It's a terrific performance, but more importantly, one which ticks a lot of boxes. He's playing a king, he fights valiantly against a disability, and it's Colin Firth's turn to win. Now, I'd be very happy for Colin Firth to win Best Actor, but when it comes to Best Supporting Actor, we find one of Oscar's most grievous omissions. For many people, the best film of the year was The Social Network, which centred on the fraught relationship between Mark Zuckerberg, brilliantly played by the Oscar-nominated Jesse Eisenberg, and Eduardo Saverin, brilliantly played by the Oscar-not-nominated Andrew Garfield. Well, to correct that howling error, the Kermode Award for Best Supporting Actor goes to Andrew Garfield. You're in New York. I'm in New York riding subways 14 hours a day trying to find yeah. advertising. And how's it going so far? No, genuinely, like, this is insane to me that you think um, I'm worthy of you know, taking this home and, and, and putting it in the most prideful place in my, in my living room. Um, and, uh, and what a wonderful, humble um, way to, you know, make uh, the award, uh, not in your likeness at all. I'm really genuinely moved by it. Thank you very much, Mark Commode. <laughs> on to Best Actress. And right about now, Natalie Portman is probably making a space on her mantelpiece for the Oscar she's very probably going to win for Black Swan. Now, I have no problem with that, other than my usual moan that it's a shame the Oscar voters have completely overlooked any performance that isn't in English. I mean, at least in Best Actor, you've got Javier Bardem speaking Spanish in Beautiful. But when it comes to Best Actress, if you're talking in a foreign language, it seems that no one's listening. So there's nothing for Isabelle Huppert, who was wonderful in Villa Armalia. Nothing for Numi Rapace, who put fabulous flesh onto the bones of Lisbeth Solander in The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, but committed the unforgivable crime of doing it in Swedish. But my vote goes to an actress who has consistently crossed linguistic boundaries. The Kermode Award for Best Actress goes to Kristen Scott Thomas for leaving. In a movie industry in which actresses have the choice of playing Babe, District Attorney or The Queen, leaving offers a proper grown-up role for a proper grown-up story. Scott Thomas plays a wealthy doctor's wife who falls for the handyman. She then has to choose whether to abandon material comfort for passion. Combien de fois t'as couché avec lui? Arrête. Dis-moi combien de fois. I caught up with her to hand her the award in person and to talk about how she made the film. Kristen, for your fantastic performance in Leaving, your Kermode Award for Best Actress. Thank you very much. This is magnificent. I'm very proud of this. Good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Tell me what you like about Leaving and why it attracted you. I felt very sort of miffed by the 
ageist things that I was coming up against. And I thought it was time to sort of rebel and, and do something that, uh, that will show older women who are living through passion, who are rediscovering their own capacity for bad behavior. Qu'est-ce que tu fais là? Je t'appelle, tu m'arrives en bas. Il vaut mieux qu'on ne se voit plus, tu sais bien. J'arrive pas. There's an extraordinary scene in the film which is um, largely non-verbal, in which your character says to Sergio Lopez's character, you know, it's to do with you don't leave, I don't need you to leave, and he says, OK, fine, tell me to leave. There's a shot, and it's the shot is on your face, and you react to him saying, OK, fine, go. Yeah. Um, can you talk to me about what's going on in that scene? For me, that moment was the key moment in the film. It's like a fuse goes in her head, and I really felt that that had to be... It had, we had to be able to read that somewhere, this this failure, this the, the crack, you know, going and and that she she should then be slightly different from then on and maybe a little imbalanced. I mean, she does lose her mind. Mm -hmm. She's mad. She's madly in love. <laughs> Men felt very uncomfortable because. watching that film. Because I think they saw the role um, played by Sergio Lopez. They saw him as a kind of object. And he actually had the girl's part, really. Yes. You know, he's this object of desire. They didn't like the way the men were perceived in that film. And yet that story yes, told the other way round is incredibly, you know, common and popular. Yeah. But women, I had uh, quite a few women confiding me afterwards about, you know, their relationships and things like that. So we must have struck a nerve somewhere. That's what stories are for. Stories are for um, sorting people out, sort of sorting your life out, helping you get through stuff. And I think that we managed to do that. J'ai besoin d'une lettre pour le divorce. Well, it's a wonderful performance in Leaving. Congratulations. This won't be the door to anything else other than itself, but... Uh, It'll be the door stop, perhaps. It'll be the door stop, it's yes. Heavy. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. So, Kristen Scott Thomas now has a Kermode to add to her collection. She was nominated for an Oscar for The English Patient, but narrowly missed out. But if you thought the best way to bag an Oscar was just to make a great film, well, think again. Here's my masterclass in how it's really done. As far as the awards calendar is concerned, the trouble, as I see it, begins with the Golden Globes. Now, unlike the Academy, whose members are real filmmakers, the Globes are voted for by 90-odd hacks who refer to themselves as the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, despite the fact that most of us foreigners have never heard of any of them. Every year, this presumably drunken bunch of bozos get together to draw up a list of famous people they really want to meet and hang out with. They then proceed to invite these famous people to what is essentially their annual work knees up by nominating their crap films. Now, you may think this sounds harsh, but how else do you explain this? Despite being a critical and commercial flop, Burlesque was mysteriously nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Musical or Comedy, after members of the Hollywood Foreign Press Association were flown on a jolly to Las Vegas to see Cher perform live. I wonder if those two events are connected. Like so many of us, Academy members have short memories, haven't seen enough movies, and are basically lazy as hell. What they're meant to do, come nominations time, is to cast their mind back over all the films that have been released in the last year and decide which ones are worthy of consideration, which, frankly, isn't an easy thing to do. It seems to me, though, that what they actually do is to wait till the Golden Globe shortlist is announced, then make their selection from that random field. And it's not just the date of the Globes which is critical. The release date of the movies themselves can be more important than the quality of the films. In order to be eligible for an Oscar, a film must have opened in the US any time between the 1st of January and the 31st of December. But if you open any time earlier than September, the chances are Oscar voters will have forgotten all about you come nominations time. So, as far as award contenders are concerned, the summer season is hardly prime time. That's when movies like Twilight, Iron Man 2 and Sex and the City fill our screens, because, let's be honest, they're not looking for awards, they're after box office. Come September, though, it's open season for statuette success, which means that during the autumn months, our screens are suddenly graced by films like Made in Dagenham, The Town and The Kids Are All Right, 
films whose makers think they might have a shot at awards glory. Mm -hmm.